Thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Eric Sutherland. I'm the team leader of protective services for the Columbia Shoeswap Regional District. And uh, uh, as part of that portfolio, uh, is the Shoeswap Emergency Program. Uh, I manage the, the Shoeswap Emergency Program and uh, the fire departments for the uh, Columbia Shoeswap Regional District. Um, the Shoeswap Emergency Program is fairly unique. It's a, a conglomeration of uh, the district of St. Louis, the city of San Mar, and the electoral areas of the CSRB that are in the Shoeswap. So um, we are uh, sitting with this emergency program. So, um, as that, uh, we have been looking at uh, some of the people fringes um, in uh, the St. Louis and Toronto Point area. Uh, over the past uh, uh, three years or so, um, as part of a, a project with the Preservation Council. Uh, and then, of course, we had the fires uh, this year, and uh, that created some um, bigger issues with uh, slope stability. And uh, we had. Can I just get you on the other side, Derek? Oh, Sorry. I, was, yeah. I didn't want to be, I was trying to be subtle, but um, just because the Zoom feed, we can't yeah, see. Yeah, it's set up for. Okay. There you go. Okay. Um, where was that? So, um, yeah, as part of the uh, as part of the uh, project, uh, uh, BGC Engineering uh, was working with the Greater Basin Council. They were in the area doing some engineering. Uh, for us instead, uh, let us know as an emergency program that the fire has caused problems uh, with some of the uh, drainages uh, around Sickness Creek, Wyoming Creek, and Coming Creek. So uh, we applied. From BBC and uh, Matthias Yakov. Uh, who did that study here to speak to us and I uh, that this evening. Uh, obviously, we're here because there are some issues uh, that need to be addressed, and uh, uh, Matthias will take us through uh, his presentation, then after um, he's done, we'll talk about some of the options that we have for response and mitigation uh, to this uh, issue. So, um, with that, I'll turn it over to Matthias, and he takes through your presentation. Thank you. Thanks very much for the introduction there. We could uh, have the first slide up, please. So welcome everybody. Feel free to move closer if you want to move closer to the screen. Um, not in the hall. Thank you. Right, I hear I'm trying to turn off the mic. We just want to see if it's easier for those others to hear online. Sure, how's that? Let's see. Can, can everybody in the room hear me? You can tell microphone. Well enough. Right. Okay. I'm happy to see you. That's better. <laughs> what I do is do I think that's the laser pointer and I think that's the laser pointer. Yeah, that's better. Okay, great. So I, I hit it from, from Germany, but I, I came here to Canada in 92 to do my degree at UBC. And ever since I've uh, worked on natural hazard and risk assessments, um, uh, particularly uh, debris flows, which is really the key lens like type that we're talking about here. I'm also quite well familiar with this area here. I was uh, sort of the main investigator of the 90. 97 Hummingbird Creek debris flow that some of you may be called by and um, acted as an extra witness for the um, Sycamus um, debris flood that happened in 2012. Uh, and I've since worked also on larger screen flow which joined the narrative. Uh, so I'm quite familiar with this in this place. All right. So um, as Derek has mentioned earlier, this we were involved in looking at very great detail of Sycamus Creek and Hummingbird Creek before the fire occurred. Um, in great detail, meaning crawling around the watershed on the alluvial fans, which is uh, where the development are existing, 
And I'm trying to figure out how often these things happen in the past and what will happen in the future, and then create these kinds of maps that help identify, um, first of all, how and if development should occur, but also to figure out how one could protect oneself through the appropriate risk reduction or mitigation measures. Um, then the fire occurred, and we know from a lot of experience that whenever these fires occur, not only is it hugely disturbing when the fire occurs, but there is an aftermath. Uh, as an example, um, I have a house in the Upper Squamish Valley, and there was a fire two years ago. We were evacuated, it came right to the property boundary, and then for days and days afterwards, we were bombarded as well uh, because I had these steep cliffs. But uh, it's it's scary. Um, from that. So in this case, there's this latent hazard in these so-called post-fire debris. The fires out, we go back to our houses, but then the whole hillside is covered with ash and no more trees. And when that happens and it rains really hard, then you can get these debris. And they don't announce themselves very much. Um, if you live just down on the fan and you're not up in the watershed, all of a sudden they come down and very quickly so. All right, I think you may have to forward this. There we go. So let me start with the findings and then I'll leave you through the So we know that. Um, um, Sycamore Street, let me study, mm -hmm. and Hummingbird Street are, let me just go one back, um, are susceptible to different, very different processes. Sycamore Street, we're not going to talk about it, but I'll just give you that as background, is subject to so called debris floods, which means a lot of water and a lot of sediment. If you want to imagine the difference between a debris flood and a debris flow, you take a Home Depot bucket, fill it with, say, 20% um, of dirt. And the rest water, you swish it around, you let it, you let it run down your kid's slide, that's a debris flood. Now, if you mix half dirt and half water in it, and you swish it around, and you slide it down your kid's slide, that's a debris flow. And it looks a lot more like liquid concrete. And it behaves completely different than a debris flow. So just a little primer to understand the difference of these processes. We know that. Uh, Wiseman Creek, which is a pretty tiny little creek, and it doesn't look like much. But now that the watershed has, in fact, burned, we know that it is now subject to these post fire debris flows. It is actually likely that such thing will happen. Why? Because we know that even a moderate rainstorm, so one that is quite, can happen quite frequently, as frequently as any other, other year, is capable of triggering these. Whereas in an unburned state, it may take a hundred year return period event. That's a, uh, an event that happens on average, one, one with a one percent chance. Um, so, um, recognizing, having recognized that Wiseman Creek is in fact subject to these cold fire reflows, we decided that um, we need to study them in some more detail because we want to make sure that people. Limit as the amounts of it are safe when uh, the inevitable rains come. So, the CSIB um, is taking this very seriously and it asked us to do this study of why we think which previously we hadn't included in that occurred. And of course, they're very interested in this study to make sure that people and property are safe. So it's given you verbally already a little bit of background, but I'll, I'll, I'll say a few more things. So obviously you all know where you are. Here's sort of an image um, from the top. Um, shows Sycamore Street. And Wiseman Creek is really a small creek that makes its way through there. It's not even all that visible in an air photograph. And here is the fan complex of Sycamore Creek, which is partially developed from taking the street itself, but partially also from Wiseman Creek. We call it an alluvial fan delta. That's sort of the size 
um, speak for this is where the creek's mouse is, and this is where all the sediment gets deposited. The, the reason why this landform is there, much like Hummingbird Creek or, or any of these sort of deltas that you find along lakes or even oceans, is not because there's a creek just transporting water. It's there because at times it transports a lot of sediment, and that lot of sediment manifests itself um, as these uh, often very disruptive or catastrophic events. And on the right side there, you see the, um, I guess the point of the from the perspective. Um, I'll, just do, I'll just use analog arms. <coughs> um, here you can see Wiseman Creek coming down, and then its apex, or whatever emerges on the mountainside, is right upstream of the trailer park. So, one thing we look at um, very quickly. I am going to trip. I don't laugh. One one thing um, that we do first of all, we, we take existing burn intensity maps, and the darker or warmer colors here indicate high to moderate burn intensity, and then the yellow lesser burn intensity. Why is that important? Because the hotter it burns, the more the less tree there is, um, and that's very important because not only are trees acting like sponges? They suck up. All of you have stood under there, they see the tree and it it, 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 down. it takes a while before you get back, right? That's what we call it the canopy. It's a fancy word for it sucks up some water. And then um, you have evapotranspiration. Evapotranspiration is a fancy word for tree sucks water out of its roots, gets it into the needles or leaves, and it goes into the air, which can be substantial or like a mature tree that can be as much as 400 meters a day. So it's not, not trivial. So when the forest burns, um, you lose the tree kind of the intercept, all water falls onto the ground if there's no needles. You have no more evapotranspiration. So the water that falls into the soil doesn't get sucked back out, it, it runs off. And you lose the root strengths, or what we call it root cohesion. Scientists always like that fancy word because it says but it, it holds the soil in place, right? I mean, when we had these slopes, we actually fell into the root holes. They burned out, often you can't see it, and you keep going in there. Is it? Well, you going to break your leg. So a lot of changes, not just the vegetation, but the whole hydrology, the whole geomorphology, the way the landscape um, changes. So a fairly significant part of the watershed did burn, and uh, we have to look at it closer. Next. <clears throat> so, just as a reminder um, and to differentiate what we're talking about here, this is an airflow from the uh, June 2012 event um, of the part of Sycamus Creek Fan that was affected, namely uh, the northern part. And you can see the trailer park, uh, of course, in the top right corner. Um, that was large treatment hazel. That was largely unaffected because it was a completely different event. And importantly, there was no fire at the time. Of course, that makes one believe if such a critical and huge event happens and nothing happens on the little wider screen, why are we even here? Why are we talking about it? And once again, it's the fire that changed everything. Now, there's a bit of a good news story in that too is the fire didn't change everything forever. The fire changes things for maybe two, maybe three years, after which there is vegetation regrowth, the soil changes its composition, and the, the hazard goes, and the, therefore the risk goes away over time. So it's not something that's going to be there forever. But we have to keep our eyes open for the next um, couple of years. So I just want to give you a few examples from elsewhere. And I'm really not wanting to scare you, but just it's sometimes hard to imagine these events that we haven't seen. Unfortunately, well, unfortunately, some of you might often get called to these events when they happen. So I have a lot of opportunity to study them in great detail, following up and down over the hillsides, uh, poking around on the fan. And, and then that, that's sometimes a depressing piece of work because people sometimes do lose their property. 
This is um, an event uh, we started back in, in 2003. So you see, this is um, on um, um, promising Nelson. No, no, it's not Nelson. It's, you know, it's, it's good, good, good minute. Minute. Thank you very much. Um, so not very far, just north of that. And you can see up here on the uh, top right image, the areas that did burn, um, the red, you know, the typical uh, burn look of the watershed. Note also that not the entire watershed, right? It was just a portion of the watershed. But sure enough, um, a thunderstorm south came through uh, in August. Um, it was hardly recorded in Preston. It was, I mean, you, you know this neck of the woods here, right? You get thunderstorms and rains like that here. You go down the Hummingbird Creek and they said rain or there wasn't water. Or vice versa. It can be quite localized. It also makes them harder to predict. And sure enough, the debris flow was triggered way up there in the upper watershed about here. And um, it picked up more and more material, we call it bulking on the way down. So the initial landslide may be quite small. It may have the area of this room and maybe just a foot deep. But once it gets going, we call it a liquefied, so it becomes like liquid concrete. And as it goes down the channel, all the loose particles that are sitting in the channel gets picked up. So do the trees, root rocks, branches, old, old vehicles, whatever there may be in the, in the channel that gets picked up. It gets bigger and bigger and bigger on the way down. How much bigger depends on how much crud or debris or dirt lies in the channel. But it can be as much as 10 cubic meters to a truck load Per meter that it travels down the street. And of course, that adds up. And not only does it add up, as soon as it, it hits or it leaves the fan apex, and again, the fan apex is where the creek leaves its confines of its ch 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 channel or canyon, and it spills out on this fan. Um, it can come down to this total of strength and speed, so as fast as the fastest personal notes can run. It can carry boulders as big as a garage. And when you take that together, boulder of that size, coming at you running speed, that's something completely different than a waterfall. You can get those through a house uh, in absolutely no time. And in fact, that is what, what happened on this fan. I think I have another photograph that shows a, a detailed close up um, there of, of two buildings. Sorry, the one is, is covered by the sign. But it, it completely crushed this building. Luckily, there was nobody in it and inundated the one above. So the impact forces, which is the velocity squared times the depth times the density, are phenom phenomenal. So you, you all know if you, if you, those of you who have made on martial arts or, or whatever, you hit something twice as fast, you hit it four times as hard. And that's important to recognize because when these things come down at um, 20, 30, 40 kilometers an hour, they are very, very destructive. destructive. So um, we, as part of our study, we looked at the history of events and we took air photographs uh, all the way back to the late 1920s when the Canadian government started to photograph these events. So we only had, almost have a hundred year record of things looking down, and we can access this through the federal air photograph, air photograph archive. And we didn't find anything on Wiseman Creek. There was no big event, but there was also no big fire in Wiseman Creek either. So we're dealing with something new. The photos that you see here, these are the ones from the Sycamus event. And again, that was a debris flood, a lot of rain exacerbated by the fact that on those days, as you may have rec may recall, the lake level was particularly high. And that um, created a problem because that very high lake level created what we call backwater, which made the creek channel leave its confounds um, upstream of the lake and therefore causing all that destruction. All right, so how do we go about looking at these things? Well, um, let's start with what is already there. So those of you who live on Wiseman Creek know that right at the very top, again, we call it the apex, um, there is a channel 
um, that has been done and the burn that has been put up because there was a problem in the past. We, we found a cedar tree that was impacted by the rock and took a tree bowl and cored it. I don't think we have a date for it yet, but I think it's like something like the 1970s. Those of you who may have lived there may remember that there may be may have been a bit of a flood there at some point. Unrelated to fire, though, as far as we know. Now, other than that, there's not much mitigation going on on Wiseman Creek Channel. Um, it is channelized, it goes through these roads here. Um, and there's a sizable culvert underneath Highway, thank you, Highway 97. Um, and then it goes on to, to Maryland. And you see where Hazel's pointing, there's actually a bit of a mini fan right there that's uh, bulging out into the um, uh, into Maryland. All right, so what do we do? Well, first of all, we look around on the fan, but then we have to go into the watershed and see what actually has changed, which we did. So we climbed out to the top of the watershed and then hiked down uh, these channels to see, first of all, is it bedrock? Is there anything that can actually be mobilized? How deep is it burned? What, how much ash is on the ground? What is the burn severity that was done from satellite images actually true? So in other words, we field check. We look at how permeable is the soil. We look at how many trees are lying in the channel. What would be the effect if there's one of these debris flows in picking up these trees or, or maybe not? Or is there an area that the debris flow could possibly deposit before we can get down to the We really want to make sure that we don't just some armchair geo, geo people, but that we actually get our fingers dirty and our boot dirty and and wipe out, which you do on that ash quite a bit, um, to, to get a true understanding of the hazard. Because this is important. We're not, we're not taking this lightly, neither are you. Neither is the CSRB. Okay, so this is really how the landscape looked like. This, it, it looks a bit like the woods. And I, I have to admit, I find it a bit depressing. Um, nature will uh, re, regain itself and, and things will grow there very quickly particularly since ash is a natural fertilizer. But when you go there right in the aftermath, it looks depressing. Now, what we found is there is quite a bit of soil. So when, when we took our shovel and we dug through this, it was ash and altered soil, like a, a foot and a half deep. And the problem with that is if it rains hard enough, that ash can and will get mobilized. Um, in little rills, the rills turn into gullies, the gullies turn into bigger gullies, and depending on how long that rain storms and how intensively it rains, it just becomes more and more and more mud, and it can get pretty ugly by the time it reaches the valley bottom. Next one. So um, we looked around, and we, we looked at some culverts because we were interested in, um, are the culverts big enough? Could they convey these kind of debris flows or what, hap or what would happen? Now, the main culvert environment from the logic road was taken out, um, which was good because culverts do not survive the reef flows ever. They always talk um, and become dysfunctional and get like that. So that was certainly worth the effort in examining. Next one, please. Now, one thing that struck us um, that is quite important. If you could just go one back, Hazel, please. The, this, this area right here, so there's these gullies um, that, that all come together here. So like a dendritic, they, they all unite. And then here is an area, it's like a bench. And that's actually good news because this bench, which was caused by glaciers and, and so on, and, and due to the natural geology of the terrain, is an area where it gets a bit flat. I don't know who of you have actually been out there. Have you hiked around in this area? You can access it actually via this, this logging road, which you, you drive down 97, take a uh, left at, um, before you get to Hummingbird Creek, and then you can, you can take your four by four over there today. Um, this flat area is, is, is good news because there's a good chance 
no guarantee, but there's a good chance that the debris flow run, may run its course there and block itself up. And the next slide is an example of that um, uh, near Arrow Lake, where just that happened. It had nothing to do with a post fire event, but there was a railway embankment, an old railway embankment, it was revamped as a Viking trail and ATV trail. It had a culvert, the culvert blocked with logging and just woody debris. Uh, it filled up, and then the whole embankment, which was pretty high, eight meters high, liquefied and became a debris flow. And that debris flow then ran down to a flattish area, similar to the one I just described at Wiseman Tree, and it created its own log jam. So all these trees that I showed you earlier that are dead trees that have fallen and crisscrossed all the channel, they will be mobilized. And when they get into this flat area, they could do just that. And I'm showing that because this could be a good news story because it could create its own log jam dam, preventing a portion or perhaps even the majority of the debris to travel further. But you can't <coughs> count on it. You can't say, yeah, we hope that that's what's going to happen. You'll be fine. It is a possibility. Okay, next one. So here then, so we, we hike then. So this was this location here, fairly flat. And we also, you'll see it later, we consider that as a possibility for mitigation. And then we kept hiking down this channel and we hiked this um, branch channel here because we wanted to see what does it look like before it gets down to the fence. And the photograph on the right shows how it looks like. It's mostly bedrock um, with some debris over top of it, but it's quite steep, 30, 35 degrees steep, which means the debris flow isn't going to stop. If it makes it to this point, it's going to go all the way down to the fence. So, and then here, right at the um, trailer upstream of the trailer park itself, there's a berm that was built and it, it does its trick of diverting the water and, and flood, flood flows, but it is very unlikely to do its trick in a bigger debris flow. The reason being that debris flows are so overwhelmingly fast and destructive and they, sh they really don't like a 90 degree bends like we have here, they want to go straight. Uh, when a debris flow goes into a bend, it's what we call it super elevates, much like the race cars do when they go around the curve, that's why the curves are made higher. The debris flow does, it, sw it swooshes up and it wants to go over the berm and it wants to roll the berm because the boulders that the berm is made out of are so small that they will become part of the debris flow. They won't stop the debris flow. In order to stop the debris flow, where it comes out at a speed like that, you need garage size or bigger boulders, not those boulders which are like this size. Next one. And then, as you very well know, that the creek goes through the uh, flattish portions of the trailer park. Um, it is not very well in size, maybe, maybe like this, or even when you get closer to the mountain, maybe up to my knee. And which means, in a case of even a minor debris flow, it will fill up the sediment and then spill over its bank. In case of a big debris flow, we won't even notice it. All right, so what are we gonna do about it? How do we understand what actually this debris flow will do if it were to occur? Well, luckily, people over the years have developed these numerical models. This is a computer model, and really what it does, it is creating a fluid, a liquid, that looks like a debris flow, but on the computer, that behaves like a debris flow, but on the computer. So there's various models, we tried out a few. We decided this one is, is a good one to use for this purpose. So we put, first of all, we had to figure out, well, how big could it be? That's the big one. How much volume? Is it a truck load? Or is it a train load? Or is it 100 train loads? And we have our tools um, that figure out by knowing what percentage of the area has burned and what intensity how much channel length is there? What is the ratio of burn towards unburn? And then we can put that into a model that tells us how large the debris flow will be. What it really depends on is, is next year going to be a drizzle on the next two years, or are we going to have big storms? 
If it's a storm that happens every year, it's pretty small debris flow or no debris flow at all. Or it's a debris flow that may get stuck up in the watershed and you'll never see it. If by chance though, you have a hell of a downpour, say like a one in 50 year storm, completely different story. Then we're talking train loads and train loads of debris that could be in the You don't want to take that gamble. And that's why we're here. That's why the CSRB has invited us. That's why we want to think about what kind of mitigation we would be interested in or one could consider in implementing between now and when the rains come. Next one. So this is this numerical model that Hazel, that's her specialty, um, does on the computer. And what this image here shows is, so we started it here. Um, what well, could have started it higher up, doesn't matter. We started it here and then let the model run down. Now you see two images. First of all, this is what we call the two-year return period event. So we figured out what is the volume of an event that happens on average every two years, given that it has burned. There is no such thing as a two-year debris flow on this creek if there hadn't been a fire. That's the reason why you haven't seen it. And the top left image shows you um, the depth of the flow, color coded, and I'll point out a few location. The bottom right image shows you how fast the flow is. So the depth and the speed tells you how destructive it is. So those are two pretty important variables. So first of all, let's talk about where the debris flow goes. So it does a turn here. It goes through these flattish areas. This channel is usually dry, except when there's a really big discharge event. Then it splits. We call the split an avulsion. So the split happens here. Part of it continues down this channel. Part of it continues down the north channel. Eventually, they unite. It runs down, hits the corner, is deflected by the berm, because this is a pretty small event. The berm will do something. It may not survive, but it certainly will deflect some degree that then runs into the channel. And eventually, the coarse part of the debris flow, the boulders, the logs, will drain to a halt. There will be still some muddy flow afterwards, and we'll show you how we simulated that. Now, to give you an idea, the flow depth down here would be up to two meters, or so I'm 180, so that's, you know, it's a six footer. Um, up in here, it's, it's shallower, maybe like half a meter, foot and a half, something like that. And of course, in the channel itself, it is deeper because the channel confines it, can't spill out. So the flow depths may even be like nine foot, 10 foot. Now, how fast? Um, well, variable depending on how steep and how confined it is, but we're talking running speed. Uh, so uh, when I jog, I run about 14 kilometers an hour. Um, when I sprint, I used to 30 kilometers an hour, those days ago, but um, it, it, it's relatively faster, but it still, it still moves at a pretty high clip. Now, again, this is the event that is quite likely it will occur. Now let's look at an event that is not so likely to occur in the next slide. So this would be a, a one in 50 year event. So it has an annual probability of one divided by five, so 2% uh, in any given year. Because it's bigger, it travels faster, it travels deeper, it travels further. So as you can see here, it doesn't care much about this bend anymore. It overwhelms the little berm. It runs all the way down to Highway 7. Um, the depth is up to three meters on the fan. So now we're talking taller than I can reach and, and like the height of the trailer, pretty much. Um, it also speeds up because the bigger, the faster. So now we're talking about um, right above the fan and like 23 kilometers an hour. So that's 10 kilometers an hour faster than the more frequent um, and more likely event. All right. So then um, we also said, well, what if that all about this numerical modeling is somebody once said all models are wrong, some are useful. And that's true. Um, simulating exactly how nature will behave is really, really difficult. There's a lot of physics and math models. So that's why we have to ask ourselves the what if questions. 
Well, what if all of these trees that are in the channel walk up and actually put the brakes on the city? I mean, you can imagine if um, somebody throwing tires in front of me and I'm going to try to run to this to this door. Obviously, there's all these tires between me and the door. I'm going to have to push them pretty hard. I'm going to be slower than if there's no tires. So if all these trees lock up in front uh, of the debris flow, they can put the brakes on, and it is possible that the debris flow will get stuck up, up there or, or stuck even further down. But again, that's a gamble that we, we don't really like to take. I don't want to stand in front of you and say, this is kind of what's going to happen. Good luck. That, that's not good. Next one. So what we did in the next round is what you saw earlier in the model. Um, you saw that maybe you can just go back three slides, Hazel. You saw that the debris flow stops here. Now that may make you think, well, great. If I live here or there or here, I'm fine. Well, not quite, because what this model simulates is when the coarse part of the debris flow with these rocks and logs comes to it, grinds the hole. It doesn't mean that there's no flooding downstream. In fact, once the coarse part is deposited, the more liquid, more gooey stuff runs over top of the coarse stuff and keeps going. And that's what Hazel modeled um, here. She split the model into the coarse stuff, the frictional stuff that grinds the hull, and then she let the more liquid afterflow go over top. It's a much more realistic way to simulate that while the destructiveness of the flow is concentrated to the top, um, near the fan apex, the rest will still inundate a larger area with muddy water, not as destructive, but a hell of a nuisance um, and need, needs a lot of cleanup. And then it runs uh, over the highway and along the highway and may even wash out the highway, similar to what we've seen in 2012 on Sycamore Again, that's the two year event. And if we go to the um, 50 year return period event, um, it is proportionally larger. So here in brown colors or orange, that's the area that would get harder hit by higher impact forces. And then the more liquid part would overshoot the highway and run all the way down to Mara Lake. So this is a possible outcome. Doesn't mean that we're going to see that next year or the year after, but it is a possibility that we cannot discard. So, what does it actually mean? Well, um, let me give you a few pictures just to envision how that manifests itself. It's hard to envision that uh, this time of the year or in the summer when everything looks good. These are all photos from post wildfire. So this is not something that happened somewhere. It's mostly down in the US, but nonetheless, it gives you an idea. If it's a small debris flow, it overtops the berm, then you may see something like that. So a lot of muddy water, maybe some stones, but it doesn't lead to structural destruction. It's a hell of a cleanup job uh, because you still have to redo your landscape and it might get into a basement if there is a basement. I mean, it's clear that people don't. Um, but it doesn't kill people. It doesn't mean that you have to reconstruct your, your home or your house or your apartment. When they become more rare, meaning rarer is bigger, then they can lead to structural damage. The, the house or the, the trailer may not be completely crumbled, but it means a rebuild or a total write-off. And then when they become even larger, and this is an event from a place called Montecito down in California, where after a big wildfire in 2018, a few months later, there was a pretty strong downpour. And in this event, unfortunately, 26 people died. It's one of the most affluent communities in California, Oprah, for those who know Oprah, um, she has her house down there and, and famous people, but they were not, prepared for this event. 26 people dying is horrific. It was a much bigger debris flow than we, than we would have here, but it was one of these cold fire debris flows. The Californians have models that tell them how big these debris flows would be. 
but they didn't have this numerical model that we just showed you to figure out who would be affected. They had a normal flood model, just clear water flood, we evacuated the people along the clear water flood paths that they had previously modeled. They sure as hell didn't do debris flow models and evacuate the people that they should have. And that's why it's unfortunately comes to the flood. So to, to just sum up this part is, I put this graph together. What this graph shows how likely it is that how bad of a debris flow will happen. So it is much more likely that next year you don't have an extreme event. Of course, extreme means rare. And you see something more like that, nuisance stuff. Still a headache, but it doesn't kill people. But if we're unlucky next year or the year after, those two critical years after a wildfire, there is a horrific downpour. You may see something like this. And I really don't mean that to scare. I really just want to illustrate that those are true possibilities. More likely, less likely, but still possible. So the best case scenario, of course, and you all recognize that, is that there's no debris flow at all, or it might get stuck in the watershed. All you see is some brown, milky, chocolatey water. That's it. The more likely scenario, though, is that there will be a small debris flow. It, mo it may stall in the watershed, or it may go down and fill up the channel, and the channel needs to be dug out, and there's um, brown water in people's backyard and so on and so forth. The worst case scenario, though, and we do have to plan for the worst case scenario, in my opinion, is that a large debris flow comes down and it really destroys trailers. And unless it has a prediction system, warning system in place, you're going to get trapped without much warning. Because once you hear them, it's too late. So, well, that's sort of the science part. And that's all fine and good. But really, what matters is what can you do about it? It's, we're not here on a science presentation. We're here to understand what can actually be done about it. And those, those are the various options to reduce risks. Well, there's always a number of things you can do. And we try to figure out which ones to do. Um, the CSRD has asked us to put together a proposal to actually figure out which one is the best ones, the most feasible ones, the ones that can be done in time before the rains come in the early summer or late spring or whenever they come. And uh, emergency management BC has given the CSIB the heads up today, yesterday, today, yeah. today that they got to fund the study. And tomorrow I'm going to be starting and Hazel doing that. Um, that study, you're going to think, wow, why another study? Do just go for it, right? Well, we got to figure out what is the best solution. It doesn't make sense to do something that can't be constructed up to next year. It doesn't make sense to do something that's going to cost fifty million dollars because nobody's going to fund it. It's got to be something practical, feasible that can be done in time and going to safeguard people and ideally property. So, what kind of options have we thought about? Well, let's go through them. Um, number one is a rainfall warning system, and I'll get into that in a little bit more detail. But essentially, what it means. We take high resolution forecasts, and when a certain forecast exceeds a threshold by which we know that these post fire refills occur, there's going to be an evacuation alert, and or depending on how high intensity rain is forecasted, an evacuation order. I know that sounds horrible because you've gone through this process, you know how an evacuation was. I, I had to witness it in my house when we were evacuated because of the fire. I stayed behind because I built this cabin for 20 years and I, I just, I had to defend it. I had a pump, I had a pond, I had a fire hose. My wife, my daughter, my, 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 my dog, they got evacuated. And I wanted to give it a, a fair chance. But I understand where you're coming from. Evacuations are not fun, but when it comes to debris flows, you gotta go. Um, th this gets people out of harm's way. It doesn't protect property. In order to protect property, there's a number of other options. Um, one of them is we go to this flattish area that I showed you earlier. Um, we built a big burn, 
And right up there, what Hazel just circled is, is a nice flat area that we could tell the debris flow, go there and deposit. Don't go down to the houses, just run your course, sit there and do whatever. It's a big burn. Um, could be not quite as tall as this, this room, but, but almost. Um, bulldozers, um, excavators, and it needs an outlet structure because the water still needs to go down in the channel. That's a big design project, and it doesn't get built, we don't overnight. It's, we're quite hesitant about it because this requires a lot of thinking, permitting, building, and engineering. It's not just an earthen berm. It needs to be designed, it needs to be properly compacted. It needs to be protected with hell of big riprap on the upstream side. The outlet structure can't be some flimsy culvert. It has to be concrete, ring walls, steel, and so on and so forth. It's not my favorite, but it's an option. Right now, we're just saying, what are the options? The next piece of the puzzle is, which one is the best one? Next one. Then you remember, I showed you the photo where all this log piles are crammed up by arrow lighting, right? So we're thinking, well, maybe we'll make use of that natural process, but we're not going to rely on chance. Well, let's help that process. Maybe we can drive some piles in there fairly quickly. They'd have to be drilled because it's bouldery. Some of you may be in the contracting business. You know, you can't handle the piles are really bold and rocky ground. You actually have to drill them. But maybe we can do that. Advantages we already have a logging road that goes up there. We just have to build like an access road down there, get these in the ground, trees come down, lock it up, help us stop the debris flow. What other options do we have? Well, there's a little space between the uppermost trailers and where the, tr the, the creek actually comes out. Maybe we can dig a hole there, out of the debris basin, and that could capture some debris. It may capture parts of the two-year debris flow, um, but it certainly won't capture 50 days. And it's also really disruptive because you live there. Right? It would be an excavator, and trucks driving up and down, and and so on and so forth. Not my, my favorite option either. But again, you gotta look at feasibility, time to construct it, costs, aesthetics, uh, disruption of, of local traffic, and so on. Um, another one is um, moving trailers. Of course, if you get out of harm's way, you can't be hit. Um, it's easy for me to say, of course. I just put a bullet on the power line slide, but it's it's first of all, it's costly. Um, you can't just pick it up. You have you have all sorts of systems hooked up to your trailers. Um, and then you have to go somewhere because the trailer is not like this. These parts are all over the place. Right? You can put it for the time being. Wouldn't have to be permanent because, as I said, the watershed recovers over time, and after that recovery, one, one could go back. And of course, many of you have probably opinions about, about those things that, that are important to, to consider as well. Yeah. Um, so let me just pause quickly and go back to this warning system, because these warning systems are really important. If nothing gets built, that's the very bare minimum that would have to be done in order to make sure that at least people are not harm's way. What you see there, this fancy graph on the right gives you on the bottom axis, the duration of rainfall, all the way from five minutes to 24 hours. On the vertical axis, we have how hard it rains, the intensity in millimeters per hour. People call this an intensity duration frequency per curve, and these things are used to size any stormwater drainage all over the place. So I don't just like using them. These black lines that you see in the background these are lines that indicate the return period of different storms. So let's let's take an example. Here's 60 minutes, one hour rainfall. One hour rainfall, <laughs> a two-year return period. This is a station standing arm, gives us 10 millimeters an hour. Now we know this PFEF means post fire debris flows. We know from quite a few studies when they become possible, when they become likely, when they become very likely, when they become pretty much certain. 
And we've already drawn these lines on here. So we know that it, for, let's say for an hour, if it rains five millimeter, which it already has, these excess of storms that have already happened, probably nothing will happen. But if it rains about um, greater than five millimeters, so between five and 10, the free flows are possible. They may happen in no cases where they have. When it rains harder than 10 millimeters an hour, we know that they quite likely will happen. And when it rains more than, say, um, 15, 20 millimeters an hour, we're pretty darn sure it will happen. Now, that particular system we've used, there was this Elephant Hill fire uh, three years ago in the Kamloops, and unfortunately, a, a, a person died in the car, they stopped a uh, convertible to put the the roof over top, um, and it started to pour, and the debris flow came down. And, um, unfortunately, the lady who was in the car was swept into the river by this debris flow. I don't think ever found it. After that, the Ministry of Transportation Infrastructure asked us that we develop a warning system for them to predict these post fire debris flows for that corridor of the highway. And we did do that, but we based it on real time rainfall as rainfall was happening. What we discovered though, was that there's too little time between the rainfall occurring and the debris flow happening. As little as five minutes, we can actually repeat in five minutes. So we had to learn the hard way that we have to go with the forecast based system. The weather forecast, the best weather forecast that environment Canada can produce tells us when these thresholds get likely exceeded. So for example, if the forecast says that there can be showers um, between five and 10 millimeters an hour of rainfall tomorrow, that that would be conveyed that message to the CSRB, who then can decide whether that triggers an evacuation alert. Or if the weather forecast says there will be uh, rainfall over 20 millimeters an hour, the decision may, may be to evacuate. Um, this is not unique. This system is used widely throughout California, Arizona, um, New Mexico, Colorado. Uh, and in fact, it was just used this year in a series of um, big rainfall events in north of uh, Glenwood Canyon in Colorado. And the highway was closed very quickly. And there, uh, many of the debris flows, close by the debris flows were triggered. Luckily, nobody died. However, some people were trapped in the tunnel because it was the vehicles on either side of the tunnel and, and so on. So, but it is something that is being used quite frequently throughout the extent of the United States uh, to, to make sure that um, people are safeguarded uh, for these post fire All right. So um, let me sum that up and then, then I'll be here as long as you want me to be for, for questions and answers. Well, um, so the, the bad news first, um, we know that there was a wildfire. We recognized it, that it incinerated a large portion of the upper watershed of Wiseman Creek, and that has created a distinct and unique hazard that we need to keep our eyes open. It's not just at Wiseman Creek. It was the Lytton fire that we remember very vividly, where Lytton was burned entirely. We've been working on, on it ever since, and there have been a number of post event at the brief rules already. One of them derailed the train, two of them derailed the train, one on the CP side, one on the CN side. Um, uh, vehicles were hit. Luckily, so far, nobody died. But we know they occur. It's not in my or Hazel's imagination. Um, they are triggered by, by storm events of much lesser intensity than a debris flow otherwise would if there were a fire. When they occur, when they get triggered, they will, they can travel all the way down to the fan. In your case, you have a little bit of a chance that it doesn't because of the flattish area once you climb up over the steep parts, but it's no guarantee that it will stop up there. And I would certainly not want to gamble that it does. Now the good news is exactly that that there is a chance it will get stuck. Um, the good news is also that this is not a hazard that's going to be there from now on forever. 
it will after 2023, um, the, the watershed will recover very quickly because of regrowth, because the soil will stabilize. Um, and of course, that can be enhanced. One mitigation measure I didn't show specifically, one could mulch with, with hay bales being done, one could um, replant purposely, one could seed from helicopters. Um, and of course, the, the, um, your uh, government, your elected officials aren't shrugging their shoulders, otherwise they wouldn't be here. Um, they're, they're keen to work with you to end us, to figure out something uh, to, to make sure that nothing nasty will happen. Okay, and that's uh, pretty much sums it up from my side. So please do ask any and all questions. I'll, I'll try to answer them as, as, as well as I can. Um, yeah, that's just the summary of the of the options again: the warning system, the physical mitigation, or getting out of harm's way. Those are really the, the three big options. Um, keep in mind, I'm the I'm the science dude, so. Um, the technical questions for me, the, the administration, administrative questions for Derek, and we'll, we'll try to sort out what I'm saying. So thanks for bearing with me. I, I wish I would have overall bad news, but then I wouldn't be here. Um, don't shoot the messenger, as they say. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll do our best to, to push this forward as fast as we can. Persons uh, are not, but I don't have to uh, and uh, yeah, please. Yes. So um, I'm just going to come around with the mic. So if you have a question, please raise your hand. We would ask that you uh, say your name and your address for the record. Um, and um, we will also be taking some questions over Zoom as well. So is there anybody who's got a question right off the bat? You can have Perfect. Okay. Yeah, no, good question. So we haven't forgotten about it. Um, we are at this stage, um, at the later stage of our analysis. We use very different techniques. techniques. Or are you referring just to the fire effects or the no. The, the whole period. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we're we're um, looking at how often floods occur, how big they can get. Of course, we have the advantage of being able to calibrate what we do on the 2012 event and the 97 event, and there was actually one in 1972, I believe. Um, so we know a, a lot about it. We've we've uh, figured out the how big, how fast. The next thing we do, and that's very different from Wiseman Creek, we model bank erosion. So to figure out what return period storm can erode the banks by how much, how much sediment could pile up again in the creek as it did in 2012, for example. And then we do a modeling exercise similar to, to that, is a different numerical model that suits to come and speak better. And then the uh, key deliverable is what we call a composite hazard. That's a map that shows all the areas that will be affected by the various scenarios that we model in different colors. And the different colors mean different things. It means how often in an area, a specific area will be impacted and how hard it will be impacted. Then it, these maps then inform the mitigation, which is going to be very different from what Weizmann is, and that mitigation will then go into the next funding stream. But so the federal government is sponsoring these studies to figure out, similar to Weizmann, what is the best mitigation. And you know that Sycamore Street has already been mitigated, and I, I purposely use quotation marks because, in our opinion, it's not sufficient. There's riprap along the channel, but the riprap. You live there, you've seen it, it doesn't go all the way to the top of the channel. So if the channel fills up, it's pretty much like it did in 2012, uh, then the river is no longer of use because the, the banks above the river aren't protected. And then it can roll backwards again. 
I don't know where you get exactly your houses, but you don't want them. You don't want them. Thank you for your studio um, there's, there's also then other potentials of setback berms, berms that will present, that will prevent that the stream evolves or jumps out of the banks again, much like it did upstream of the island. Uh, then, then we would be working with the district to figure out um, what areas can be developed versus should probably not be developed or redeveloped, um, uh, or can be developed in a way that is uh, passive, whatever, uh, recreational site, uh, and so on. So that's, that's the stage what we're at. Um, our report is due by the end of March. And um, it will contain all these elements. And the same, if anybody here lives on Hummingbird or uh, Swansea Point, the same for that. Uh, and I believe there will be also public meetings in which we present the results. Good. Okay, so just for Martin, I don't know if they take a move, but I do have concerns. Um, you were talking about the possibility of trees locking up to prevent them from sliding, but what would happen if there was so much force behind them that the bursting of it would be catastrophic? So exactly. is, it, is it worth taking that risk at all? Is is one of my questions. And then my second question is I know that you're focusing on rising peaks right now, but what have the fire done to the integrity of Highway 97. Okay, those are... Oh, stand up there, sure. Good luck. <laughs> but, uh, um, so both is a very good question. Um, number one, the, your first part of the question, what if uh, the trees lock up and there's so much pressure behind it that it bursts? Uh, and exactly that has happened. Um, these are, we, we have a name for it, as we have names for everything, log jam outburst floods, right? Um, and that's exactly why I gave you the example as a, this could happen, but this is not something we want to count on. We cannot rely on that to happen. Now, if we were to drive these piles, these piles would be designed that they could withstand these forces. So even with the logs jamming against the piles, the logs don't, go through the piles. Well, the odd one may, but typically they hit a pile, they immediately take, it, take a, a sharp turn and then they lock up. And then the next tree hits it and locks up and so on. But the piles would be designed, I mean, these wouldn't be flimsy piles. We're talking, we're talking piles like, like this size, um, driven five, six meters into the ground, possibly concrete fill um, with big rebar in it. Um, so these piles would, would stop the the, the logs for sure. But I don't want to rely on this log jam happen naturally and you say, well, we'll see. Your, your second question, what has it done to the integrity of Highway 97A? So we didn't study that in, in detail, um, but there are, as we know, fires above the highway and there, there can be um, post-fire effects, but the post-fire effects are typically limited to the creek channels. So where there is a creek channel that goes all the way down to the highway, yes, there could be an effect. Now the risk is quite different. Even though you've heard the sad news that on the Duffy Lake Road on November 15th, four, probably five people perished in a debris flow because they were at the wrong spot at the wrong time. But for individuals, because you're in transit, the exposure to the risk is really low. Yes, there is a chance, but the chance is very, very low. In, in all of British Columbia, there have been about 20 people died in the history of British Columbia in debris flows hitting highways, which of course, compare that to any traffic accident, it's a tiny number. Um, it's very different in a place where you live because you spend a very large portion of your time in your property or around your property. So the risk from a debris flow at your own home is way, way, way higher than you traveling on a highway. 
Could the highway get cut off by these post fire vehicles? Absolutely. It's possible, at least for one or two years, and then it settles down. Does that answer your question? Okay, we're just going to take a couple of questions on from our online guests. Um, so we have one. Um, considering how much rain we've had over the past month, are we just fortunate that this hasn't happened yet? Yeah, it's also uh, an excellent question. Um, we looked into exactly that. So what Hazel did is she took all the storms that have happened since the fire, went to the rain gauges nearby, and um, there's one in Sycamore's and Malakwa and Salmon Arm. She, she obtained the data and she plotted the rainfall data on that graph that I showed you earlier. And she found out that none of these rainstorms, even though there was a lot of rain, but none of them exceeded the intensity necessary to trigger the rainfall. And in fact, when was it two weeks ago when we were back here? Yeah. We, went, we, came, we came back here to see, did actually any of these rainstorms, what was the effect? So we were here in October, was it? And then, mm -hmm. and then again, after these storms that have traveled through and we hiked the channels again, because we wanted to see what happened. Did anything happen? And why did it happen? So the answer is, while there was a lot of rain, the intensity of the rain, so the rate of rain, was not strong enough to trigger the brief flow. Okay, we have another question. Um, and from the winter aspect and the snow as well. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the excellent presentation. I think I came in a bit late. What was the risk for Two Mile or Sycamore's Creek of having a similar event as described for Watson Creek? Yeah, so um, Two Mile, what, what is referring to a Two Mile? Is the, the, the neighborhood around Sycamore's Creek and on the alluvial fan. Oh, that's, the that's, whole, two, that's, that's okay, two Mile. All of it is Two Mile, okay. Right. Um, so, um, Sycamus Creek was a debris flood, and there's a huge distinction between debris flood and debris flow. Sounds very much alike, I realize, but a debris flood is very high flood that moves a lot of sediment along the bed of the stream by boulders bouncing and rolling along the bed of the stream, and it can erode its banks. What you've seen on Coquihalla River and Coldwater River in the November 15 storms, those were debris floods. They're particularly dangerous because they can move millions of cubic meters of sediment. That's not as much as was moved in Sikkim in 2012, it was tens of thousands, but they can erode its banks several tens of meters in a single event. They can aggrade its bed, which means the bed of the creek builds up by several meters and thereby the conveyance of the stream gets limited and it spills out all over the fan. So very different processes. One at Sycamus Creek was a debris flood. The one in 1997 on Hummingbird Creek or Swansea Point was a debris flow that moved a boulder larger than, than this building in height. That's not the problem with two miles. The problem was there's a bridge across the creek. 97, they took it out, they put it back in, did the same thing in 2012. The bridge across the cross. The truck, mm -hmm. truck, the truck dog jammed behind the bridge, and that fact carries it off. Yeah, so that was, so you get into the heart of really um, the technical aspects of that loss. I've lived there since 68. I know exactly what happened. Yeah. So the, the truck may have had an influence because it, it allegedly did get the stuck. Bridge, the bridge was very hard. The creek came up three feet when we got these grains. There was no debris came down. Yeah. Um, the, the exacerbating fact was, so there's a number of things there. One is there was also an avulsion upstream of the 97 highway bridge, maybe 150 meters upstream. Yeah, it up and then got jammed behind the highway bridge. Yes, uh, and all that, you know how much the bank eroded in 2012, right? A lot of that sediment pushed the creek over to the other yeah, side. Yeah, well, I explained it to the roof. Exactly. It found it two, two miles down the road and it went to water high school. Exactly. So there was, there was those two effects. And then the problem that the lake level was so high is when the creek comes and meets the lake and the lake level is really high, 
the boulders really slow down. T take an analogy, you go down a, a water slide into a water into a, a pool, you'll slow down a lot when you hit the pool. Yeah. Well, I'm saying is the bridge isn't there anymore. Yes, but what I'm saying is that is not the reason why this event can't reoccur. This event will reoccur if there's another discharge event that coincides with high Yeah, it wouldn't have been blocked, it wouldn't have gotten backed up, the bridge hadn't been there. Um, I disagree. It would have backed up either way. The Sir, bridge. Do you have a question about why it specifically? Or? No, I live on Two Mile Creek. I know exactly what's going on at Two Mile Creek. Thanks very much, sir. Anybody have another question? And if you could just state your name and your address. Uh, I don't know if you can move to that in the local street. Uh, is there any concerns with uh, snow milling and spring melt causing any flooding, or is that generally a slow enough process that it's not similar to the weather spring fall event? Yeah, that's also an, an excellent question. So, um, could snow melt trigger a debris flow? Typically, no, very rare. And the reason being that the water doesn't ingress into the soil, much like you just said, it's slow enough um, that it just infiltrates and, and it uh, runs off either sufficiently or subsurface. There is an exception though, if you have a big rain on snow. So imagine it's April or May, and there's still a significant snowpack in that critical portion of the watershed that has burned at high intensity, say a foot. And of course, as we all know who hike in the mountains, um, by that time of the year, that's really wet snow. It's heavy as hell. It's got maybe 800 kilos per cubic meter. Meaning it's like a full sponge. It doesn't take on a lot more water, if any. So if you have a big rainstorm then, that, and we also know rain on snow melts the snow faster than just warm temperatures. So if you have a warm rainfall event, that snow can melt very quickly. The ground will then be fully saturated, and then you could still get in the brief. Rain on snow bad, just normal snow melt, very unlikely to trigger. Anybody else? Uh, question about snow programs and yourself and whatnot. And the key component to this is communication with the people that are in that jurisdiction of, of the community and how important that is. And so that we all know and we're all informed ahead of time because of what's just taken place in the province. Being proactive is extremely important in this particular situation. And that's what you're being, you're being proactive. And uh, how important is it to those people out of the well, Absolutely essential. We see what could be absolutely catastrophic, and we're bringing this forward, and so that people realize, you know, the potential danger that it might be, and what the potential consequences will be, and what they might be willing to do in order to prevent that. This is about safety. It's about looking after our community, and we know what can happen out of the well. It's happened in the past. And so you bringing this forward to the community is absolutely essential. And for that, I want to thank Derek and Kathy and yourself in order uh, to make sure that the community is well informed. And I hope that we continue to keep them informed, you know, in the future because it's essential for all of those people out there and for everybody in the community. The wildfire was really uh, a challenge for us in every prospect of, of, of the wildfire. And we've had flooding issues here, and I you know, mean, and these these elements of communication are absolutely essential. So keep it up and thank you very much for what you've done tonight. Appreciate the comments. Anybody else have a question? Uh, yeah, I have a question is to you. Um, do you see uh, a plan forward, and do you think that there would be um, grant funding 
uh, available from senior levels of government to assist with any mitigation that takes place? I can answer the first part of the question and then mm, yeah. I'll hand it over to Derek for the second part. So uh, is there a plan? There is. So EMBC through Derek has given us the thumbs up on doing this option analysis. You may wonder what does that actually entail? Well, you have a few things that I've laid out that you could do. Now our job is to figure out what is feasible technically, financially to do in the time we have. Because we can't say, yeah, we'll build it by 2024. That doesn't serve anybody. It's got to be done quickly. So we'll go systematically through this. We have to figure out what the costs are, the, the permitting requirements, what the community thinks, and so on and so forth. It's not a trivial decision that I do in the afternoon. Um, and then it, we, we home in on maybe one or two options that look feasible. I'll carry that to Derek, and then Derek can answer the second part of it. Yeah, so uh, once Hazel and Matthias get back to us with their, um, their thoughts on the best strategies going forward, then it's our job to go to Emergency Management BC and try to secure funding uh, to implement some of those plans. Uh, in the meantime, uh, we have some short-term strategies that uh, we need to explore, including um, the uh, early warning system that uh, B BGC is developing. Um, we need to in, get that in place uh, fairly quickly so that um, if in the meantime, before we get those mitigations in place, that we have an event, we know what the trigger points are to uh, force an evacuation of the area to keep people safe. And, uh, uh, and then part of that plan is engaging with um, members of the community such as yourselves to um, assist in um, addressing any vulnerabilities in the community and uh, engaging in what are the best strategies uh, for your community. So each community is unique. There's some overarching um, mitigation strategies or evacuation strategies that work for most communities, but each community also has its own nuances and we wanna tap into those nuances. We wanna engage you as community members and try and um, and capture um, the best uh, possible system that we can for the two mile area and in particular the Sickness Creek Mobile Home Park. So um, we would like to um, gauge some interest in getting a neighborhood emergency program started up in the two mile area. Uh, we would love to have one specific to Sickness Creek Mobile Home Park and, uh, and then we internally, we've developed some uh, emergency social services or support services strategies um, for right here in the community. And we'll we'll uh, position some resources uh, in the community and have we have a number of volunteers in Sick Moose. We've, we've always had a, a good, um, solid group of uh, ESS volunteers in Sick Moose and we'll engage them uh, to help us respond to this event as well. So um, that it'll be neighbors helping neighbors and uh, not just um, us who live in Salmon Arm um, coming down here and, and trying to do the best we can. It'll be actually sick of those people, helping sick of those people. So um, those are, are some of the thoughts that we're uh, developing right now. Um, we do have a little bit of time um, because as the, the snowpack uh, gets in there, it acts as that sponge, like Matias says, and uh, we the risk um, doesn't become most prevalent until that snowpack is gone uh, during the spring fresh up. So um, we're kind of um, working with the timeline of the beginning of April, late March, as the beginning of that uh, kind of process, and then through uh, to the end of June. And of course we reached high lake levels in July, which is always a, a tough time as well. So um, hopefully that answers your question, Ron. Funding. Oh, yes. So uh, we're working with the NBC um, to um, try and secure up that funding. We run into um, some issues um, in that uh, EMBC, uh, there's, there's protocols in place to pay for response costs, but there's not a lot of protocols in place to pay for uh, mitigative effort. Um, the certainty and the dire predictions uh, that BGC is making 
um, allows us to make the argument that this is likely going to happen. And uh, for every, it's been proven that conservative numbers say that for every um, dollar spent on mitigative efforts, you'll, you'll save $7 in response cost. So I think that really applies in this circumstance because the likelihood is so high uh, that something is gonna happen that um, it would be um, unrealistic for EMBC to disregard the fact that um, this uh, situation can be mitigated far less expensively and at, with far less social cost than uh, if we just um, went the normal route and paid for response. So that's the route that we're taking right now. Um, the grant process uh, generally takes a little too long uh, for dealing with this event. So the imminency of this event makes it difficult to deal with as well. So we're just going to take another couple questions from online. Okay, this is Bob who says, you talk about an increase of debris flood for Wiseman Creek over the next two years. Does the increased risk also exist for the Sycamus Creek watershed area to the north of Wiseman? The analysis does not seem to cover Sycamus Creek to the same extent. Sure, so um, Sycamus Creek, we're actually studying at, at an even greater detail than, than Wiseman Creek. Um, we did also look in the Sycamus Creek watershed to identify the effects of the water. Um, Hazel and I drove and hiked through the watershed to see what the effects of the fire uh, would be. The fire itself did not affect as much of, proportionally as much of the Sycamus Creek watershed. There could be some smaller post wildfire debris flows on some of the side slopes going into Sycamus Creek, but Sycamus Creek is again, not prone to debris flows, but debris floods. So the post fire effect on Sycamus Creek is not as dramatic as it is on Wiseman Creek. Sycamus Creek, however, is and will continue to be prone to these extreme um, storm effects like we've seen in 97 or 2012. So Sickness Creek is less affected by the fire. Less affected by the fire proportionally than Wiseman Creek. It was about 7% burned for Sycamus Creek. Okay. And Hummingbird, I think, was about 3% badly burned. And Wiseman? And Wiseman was, I, I believe it was about 30% plus. So, and it's just different. It's a different slope. It's a different... Um, yeah, I guess there's just different drainages. And so the geometry of, of it as well and, and whatnot, and, and just the conditions for debris flooding and debris flows are different for the creeks. So we are looking at it as part of our broader study. So, and we were looking at it before the fire as well, so. Like I said at the beginning, uh, BGC has been engaged for the last three years, uh, studying some of these steep slope drainages throughout the CSRD. And, uh, and our drainages here um, are warranted a deeper study and the, the first uh, grant funding that we could get uh, for deeper study, these were our top priorities in the entire CSRD. So um, these and uh, the flood risk on uh, Eagle River and the, the flood risk on Salmon River are what they're studying for us right now. Hey, we've got a all right, we've got another question. What are your technical thoughts on the risk to new development on the two-mile floodplain, given our knowledge of the increased risk? Okay, um, can we ask the person who's asking um, which, which new development she or he is referring to? Oh, no, no, no. And there is a follow-up question. I'll just give it to you now. Sure. Um, which is, um, would a large berm and catch basin be a possible solution? For Sycamus Creek. Uh, for the, I, I'm assuming for the two-mile floodplain. Yeah. 
Um, so uh, berms, yes, basin, yes. Uh, so what one, what one can do with these debris flood prone creeks is to build essentially a berm with an upstream basin that withholds the sediment. Because once again, the sediment is enemy number one in that it fills the creek. Once the creek is full of sediment, it spills out to both sides. Uh, a good example of that being mitigated right now is at the town of Canmore, whoever has been there. Uh, you remember the 2013 floods that created havoc in, in uh, Calgary, High River, Canmore. And um, there was a very nasty debris flood event on Cougar Creek, uh, which has, I think, a thousand homes or so on it. And they're building a basin, a debris barrier and basin right now against debris floods. Uh, in the case of Cougar Creek, it costs $40 million. Uh, in the case of Sycamore's Creek, it's not quite as big of a watershed, it would cost less. But yes, it is a possible viable uh, mitigation strategy for the long term. Okay, and the area um, that Bob was referring to in his question initially about the new development is the parking lot for the houseboat company. Okay, so upstream of Highway 97A, I, I think that's what he was referring to, or or perhaps even downstream of Highway 97A. Uh, either way, um, without mitigation, um, I do not think it would be a good idea to allow any development, any permanent development to go ahead uh, at that location. It's not a question if it will reoccur, an event like the one in 2012, it's a question of when it will reoccur. Okay, and the final question, uh, does the BC government have an embargo on floodplain development? No, <laughs> there's no embargo. <clears throat> um, there is a number of guidance documents that specifies whether or not you can build on a floodplain. Just to make it clear, the floodplain is referred to the flat area along a river and the alluvial fan or fan delta is what we have a two mile or it's once in point. So there's quite distinct things. For either there's guidelines um, regulatory guidelines and professional practice guidelines. So the Association of Professional Engineers and Geoscientists, they have guidelines like the legislated um, assessments for floodplains in BC and changing climate and others that specify what the professionals like us have to do. And then there's guidance documents that say how and if you can develop on a floodplain, that there's a certain flood construction level that there needs to be um, diking up to the one in 200 year return period event uh, with a certain freeboard afforded on top of it and so on. So there is regulation, but there's no embargo. Okay, so going back to the previous question, um, does this mean that the Wiseman Creek development should be put on hold pending the mitigation measures that are determined? What is the Wiseman Creek development? I believe they're referring to Sickness Houseboats in the, park, the parking lot there, but there's a lot of going on. Okay, so to be clear that the Vinco property, or houseboat property, is not affected by Wiseman Creek at all. Um, and the question was, should it go ahead? Yeah, it's asking if uh, it should be put on hold pending mitigation measures um, being determined. But your response is that this this area is not affected. Not affected by Wiseman Creek. It is the most hazardous part of the fan of Sycamore Creek. Um, now, I'm not familiar with the type of development that's being proposed. I'll have to educate myself about that. Um, but if it's permanent development, such as housing, in my opinion, it needs to acknowledge and reconcile the fact that it is the most hazardous portion of this fan. The hazard that we've seen in 2012 has not gone away. 
Um, so they are saying the development that is abandoned on the Wiseman Creek between Highway 97 and the lake. Oh, okay, I know what you mean. So this is this is as you drive towards Hummingbird Creek, there is a concrete foundations. It, something was started and it was never finished. Um, well, with respect to Wiseman Creek events, I would not rush ahead with this development until we've sorted out the part, the post fire uh, event uh, story and what kind of mitigation has been there. Again, in the longer term, I don't see a reason why it shouldn't be built for, from a hazard point of view, or there may be other reasons, but from a hazard point of view, um, because as I said, the watershed will recover and the post fire debris flow hazard will go away by itself. Okay, do we have anybody in our audience uh, starting more questions? Of uh, mitigation. Uh, and if, for instance, uh, one of the suggestions is a debris basin, will you have the ongoing cost of maintaining that debris basin as part of the information that you provide? Because that is going to be one of the most expensive um, things that, that will be ongoing forever. You always have to make sure that that debris basin is emptied out and uh, reinforced if necessary. You know, once you've got it, you have to maintain it. You have that money in your in your reserve to to look after it, and, and it could be quite a significant to the residents. So I got a question for you. Are you an engineer? Yeah. <laughs> no, she's she's been around. <laughs> okay, she knows this stuff. Huh? So you're you're one hundred percent right. Um, operational maintenance is a huge issue um, because somebody needs to own the structure. And that's really where it comes in. Um, who owns it and who wants to inherit those costs of cleanup and maintenance? Uh, it is a huge criteria in, in analyzing the options. Now, to be clear, our option analysis will not, is not the same as a design study where we come up with cost estimates for tender, tender ready. The purpose of our study is to figure out what is the most logical, smartest, um, best in all of these criteria type of option. Cost plays into it, but not at the finessing. We will, we will have a column that rates it by O and M costs, but we won't specify the exact costs. That's like a design aspect. But if, it's, if the costs of operation maintenance exceed that that is available through the district or whoever is gonna own the structure, then it makes no sense to build it in the first place. Can't maintain it, what's the point of building it? So yes, it's a <laughs> very good point. Okay, we got any other questions from the audience here? I'll check back in online. Are we doing Sarah? Do we have any more questions online? Are these issues under the control of the CSRD or the District of Sycamores? So um it's uh, it's uh, the risk and uh, where the risk and the hazard meet is when we have a population base. So um, these types of debris flows um, happen, happen fairly frequently uh, where there's no people and uh, they're benign events. And uh, so they don't affect anybody. They just happen in uh, the wilderness as a natural occurrence. But when they affect people, then it becomes an issue. So um, if this is to happen in Hummingbird Creek, then that is a CSRD issue. If this is to happen in Sycamus Creek or in Wiseman Creek, it's a district of Sycamus issue. Uh, the reason why we're here today is because um, the district of Sycamus and the CSRD and the, the uh, city of Salmon Arm share an emergency program. So we all have skin in the game and we all uh, will be at the table together um, helping to manage this. So the, uh, in essence, uh, Wiseman Creek is a, a District of Sickness issue, but the Shoe Truck Emergency Program is the District of Sickness's emergency program. And it's the managing partner just happens to be the CSRD. Okay, we have any more questions? Okay, 
And we've got another question um, back to um, development. Will your report state that you would not scientifically rec recommend any development on the alluvial fan due to flood? And just to be clear, the alluvial fan of Sycamus Creek or of Wiseman? We're going to ask Bob. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> So while we're waiting, uh, what I would ask uh, from the in-person audience and uh, and certainly from the online audience too, is that if there's anybody um, in the affected areas that would be interested in um, helping us establish a neighborhood emergency program, we would absolutely love to hear from you. Um, and uh, like I said before, uh, we're certainly interested in um, the uh, Sycamus Creek Mobile Home Park, um, but uh, also the surrounding affected areas. So. We've got Bob's answer, which is Sycamus Creek. So can you just repeat the question, please? Will your report state that you would not scientifically recommend any development on the alluvial fan due to flood, as he's referring to second Creek? Okay, so we'd have to look at a bit more nuanced. So this hazard map that we'll be creating will show certain areas that are safer than others or even completely safe. In those safe areas, and I mean most of the fan is developed apart from the uh, Vinco property. Um, redevelopment, yes, if it's in a, in a certain green zone, let's say a yellow zone, it could be redeveloped without many, if any obstacles at all. If it is in the orange zone or the red zone, all of which have distinct meanings, then development may either be um, could go ahead in an orange zone with certain caveats. So the building would have to be flood proofed, which may be quite expensive. If it's in the red zone, it may not be able to be uh, constructed at all. So that's a no-go. Depending on though, if in the next funding submission to a federal grant, which is currently being revamped, they may come out with another funding stream for um, mitigation, overall fan mitigation, not specific homes, but something built close to where the creek comes out of the canyon. And that would then help everybody. Once that is built, that that could then allow areas to be built on that are currently unsafe. Okay, so anything else from, uh, from our gallery here tonight? We don't have anything else online, so I'll just uh, give people online here a warning that um, we will be cutting things off unless we have some more questions. Well, I, I just want to say quickly thank you very much for all those questions. They are they're really well thought through, and uh, I appreciate everybody asking and being engaged in this. Uh, we'll do our best on our side. To push this along as I know it's Christmas time coming up, but to push this along as fast as we can to get the ball rolling. Fantastic. And uh, uh, this doesn't end here uh, at this meeting. If you get home, you think of a question, uh, please do uh, feel free to call us or to email us either through the district or through uh, the Shoe Shop Emergency Program. And we're more than happy um, to uh, continue the dialogue. Um, after this meeting. So uh, we wanted uh, this meeting to uh, create some awareness in the community and uh, to get some uh, buy-in uh, from the residents to our mitigation plans and uh, to allow uh, the residents the opportunity to become part of the, um, their own uh, resilience of building efforts and uh, uh, their own solutions to this uh, significant problem. And I thank you all for coming. Okay, we do have um, one more question, which is um, what's going to be the communications going forward? Right. <laughs> do you want to answer that, Tracy, our communications coordinator? Um, I, can, um, I can speak to that a little bit. Um, so we are hoping to continue open channels of communication. Obviously, the NAP is going to be a key piece um, in our communication. 
Um, we are also hoping to hear from residents about some of their preferred ways they like to communicate. There are some options here in terms of creating um, regularly scheduled meetings, um, in terms of a, a Zoom call to update residents, or to create a, a somewhat like a newsletter or an email bulletin that, that residents could receive. So we are eager to hear from uh, residents about what their sort of preferred communications would be like. We're, we also want to encourage all the residents to sign up for our Alertable app, our Alertable program, which will um, provide a key component in alerting people if there's an evacuation alert or order. So for those of you in the area, I know many of you in this area are familiar with, uh, with the Alertable program from the fires, but that is something that you can go on to the CSRB's website and sign up for that. Um, that service will alert you at any time of day or night um, to your phone, to your um, to your uh, device, if you have a device in your home, like a home computer, or if you have one of those fancy Alexas, it will, uh, it will alert to that as well. Um, so please feel free to sign up for that. Um, and going forward, our plan is to try to communicate on a regular basis with the residents as we're getting more information. Um, and I'm assuming, Derek, there also is going to be communication once um, some of the more steady work and the results of the mitigation study are available. Yeah, absolutely. Did you want to add anything? Or? No, we'll just, uh, we'll just endeavor to keep the community informed as, uh, as the developments come in. And, uh, and as we continue our work with BGC on uh, our mitigated strategy. So um, this is the the first uh, time that we're before you, but it certainly won't be the last. Um, it, it likely won't always be in a town hall that takes a lot of resources, um, but uh, we will uh, endeavor to communicate effectively with the, with the group. And uh, certainly if you feel like you need to know something, uh, you're more than welcome to email or to call um, anytime you have a question. And uh, we'll make sure that the appropriate contact information is going to be posted on the District of Sycamore's website, as well as the Chief Shop Emergency Program. Um, so do feel free to, to go there or to call. Um, we're happy to answer any of your questions. We will be posting a recording of this meeting um, on the District of Sycamore's website. So if you uh, if you want to catch up or let your neighbors know, um, obviously we pulled this meeting together rather quickly, um, and so not everyone was able to make it tonight. Um, so we are really hoping that uh, that neighbors will be sharing information with neighbors, and uh, that if you do have questions, you certainly approach us. That's what we're here for. Um, we're eager to work with you and to try to make the communication as seamless as possible. Uh, we've got one more question here. Um, will the report be made public? Um, that uh, I guess which report is, is it? The uh, the initial report. We're asking. Okay. So uh, generally, um, if as long as there's no confidential elements within the report, um, then we'll make it public. Um, if there are elements that we have to redact then we will redact it and make it public um, in collaboration with BGC to make sure that um, they're okay with that. But yes, uh, generally that is our practice. And they are um, referring specifically to the report in March, I believe on a second list. Yes. And yes. that would go oh, yeah. as well. And that report uh, has been commissioned by the Fraser Basin Council. So um, it'll be available uh, through the CSRD, but also through the Fraser Basic Council. I don't need the mic, Tracy. Uh, just, just another a shout out to what Tracy was saying. So, in terms of letting people know, in terms of uh, moving forward, if anything, that we've learned tonight, and I, and I uh, this summer after the wildfires, I did download the Alertable app. And I know in this world, there's a million apps. This is a great app. So go to your Google store, go to your Apple store. It's just Alertable. And I have it here. 
And you know, right now on December the 12th, for example, there's advisories of Balahat Highway, there's a snowfall advisory. There's a transportation incident at Highway 3, there's a snow squall, there's a transportation incident, there's another snowfall for parts of BC. Advisory all throughout the province, all these different events. It's easy. I think if everybody were to download this moving forward, and when we get to this one of part of the mitigation options of these early warnings. Everyone has that learnable app downloaded. Everyone carries a phone. Please, what Tracy's saying, just go down and download. It's very easy. And every day, this phone just gives you updates on what's going on in the province, but specifically to the Shushan region. I think that will help as we move forward on trying to advise everybody what could or could not happen this spring in Russia. Thank you. Let's see if I could say something real quick. Uh, so this is a bit different than what we've experienced uh, from the wildfires, big plume of smoke, and we're watching the planes and the helicopters. We don't have that in this particular instance, but I have to say that the threat is still there. Uh, Matthias has been awesome with uh, giving us the information. And uh, I really think the community of Two Mile, and uh, uh, in particular, the, uh, the Sycamore's trailer park, uh, really need to pay attention to this. Um, so if you're from those areas, if you're online on Zoom, uh, fantastic, but um, let people know that there is definitely a threat up there and uh, we need to pay attention to it. And this is kind of the first step to getting people alerted about it and starting to work towards some solutions. We sure, certainly appreciate the people that have shown up. It's fantastic. Thanks very much. Uh, we're going to move on to Lots of literature here. Um, for those of you who are online, um, we do have a lot of preparedness pamphlets and some that are specifically related to post wildfire debris flows. This will all be available at the District of Sycamore office. So if you're in Sycamore doing your errands or your shopping, you can always stop in during their business hours and they'd be happy to supply you with the informational pamphlets that are present tonight. Thank you very much everyone for coming. Welcome to the evening. Take care of the evening. Can you snatch one of these? Oh, please, yeah. Thank you. Thank you.